morning and turn with me once again to the book of Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Now, we have been learning that the glue to the family, the glue to any relationship is commitment. Commitment. And that's the glue which ties a family, a relationship together. A, a church family. We need to have commitment to one another. Commitment first and foremost to the Lord. But the oil, as we talked last week of the family, is communication. Communication. Now, it is the oil which makes things run smoothly in any, any relationship. Now, most pe people really don't know how to communicate. They do fine when they're in that dating relationship. Uh, you know, the, the boy and the girl, they say, well, we can just spend hours talking uh, to one another. And it's amazing. They, they are uh, uh, excited about that. But then something happens in marriages. Something happens in families. Something happens in churches that hinders communication. You realize just as in, important as communication is to a marriage, it's also vitally important in a church that we communicate, that we know, don't uh, uh, keep things to ourselves and grumble maybe behind people's backs or talk, gossip. Uh, those kind of things will destroy uh, a, a relationship. Last week in Ephesians 4, we saw those communication killers. I'm not going to rehash all of that, but I think this passage in Ephesians 4 is one of the clearest in the entire Bible when it comes to talking about communication. So let's begin reading there, Ephesians 4, verse 25. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give peace, or excuse me, give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the things which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceedeth out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. And then in chapter 5, verse 1 and 2. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ hath also loved us, uh, and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. Once again, our Heavenly Father, we ask that your will be done here today. Help me to preach this message with power, with clarity. And I pray that, God, you would fill the... The, those that are sitting in the pews this morning with thy spirit so that they can hear, understand, and be able to apply these truths to their personal life. Help the young people to sit up straight, to listen, and as well as all of us, that we'll focus in on the message you have for us. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, communication, young people, I don't want you to tune me out because I know many young people today really do not have a clue how to communicate. You may be able to text with two thumbs with lightning speed, but sometimes you talk just like that. You don't uh, look people in the eyes. You don't uh, take time to listen and communicate with other people. And a lot of it is that you just haven't done that. Uh, you know, a lot of the problems in, in, your, in school uh, with uh, one another, a lot of it's communication. You just don't communicate. And so I'm going to help you as well today. I think this is, uh, there are some truths here from the Word of God that if we apply them, they'll help us to be better communicators and help us to hear one another. First of all, this is something that needs to be applied in your 
relationship, whether it be marriage relationship, a family as a whole, or a church, or wherever it is. Number one, apply truth. It says there in verse 25, let's read it again. Wherefore, put away, uh, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor. And people say, no, wait a minute, that's our neighbor. Uh, that's not talking about husband and wife. That's not talking about uh, anything else but our neighbor. Well, who is any closer than your own family uh, as being a neighbor? And so <laughs> this definitely is, is applicable to every relationship. And so, number one, apply truth. Put in your talks, your conversation, and el the element of truth-telling, truthfulness. Uh, you build on truth, truthfulness by speaking truth. Oftentimes, we are tempted to lie to save our own neck, to save our own embarrassment. And so... If we, but we need the element of truth in our, our conversation. <clears throat> Somebody says, boy, preacher, you got that right. I, you know, that's right down my alley. I tell it like it is. I let people have it, tell them like, just the truth. I give them a piece of my mind. Well, you might be, want to be careful of doing that because you may not have much to spare, right? If we keep giving a piece of our mind away. But look there at verse 15 as well in this chapter. It says, but speaking the truth in what? Love. In love. Now, some people claim they are being truthful when really they're just being brutal with that truth. If you, uh, and, and again, I, I see this in young people and adults as well. It, it seems like when we, there's bad news to tell, boy, we can't wait to get to that phone, to get to that person. We want to be the first to tell everybody that bad news. First of all, we need to be careful. You say, but preacher, it was, it was true. It may be true. But why pass along bad news? Why pass along things that are just hurtful? So somebody had a bad day. Maybe somebody did some things that wasn't appropriate, wasn't right. And, and uh, so you're going to be the first one to go let everybody know what they did, what they said. Let's be honest here. How many of us have acted in the wrong way? Got up early in the morning. I don't know, maybe some of you jump up singing. That, that's great. Kind of like those uh, cartoons, you know, they jump out of bed singing songs. And uh, that may be the way it is. But some people have a hard time, don't they, Cooper? Some people have a hard time getting out of bed. I grew up some boys out of bed this, this past week. And, but, uh, but my point is, Let's, let's be slow to pass along bad news. Let's not even do that. What, what's the use of doing that? And let's uh, uh, use, our, use truth to help, to encourage. Speak the truth in love. Um, see, you can be cruel with the truth. Now, children are that way, aren't they? Because they don't have any filter. You, you know, you're around children and says, boy, you're really ugly. They don't, you know, or other things, you know. Uh, and, and they just have no filter at all. And uh, you and I as adults, we should have, and teenagers, you should have a filter by now. You shouldn't. It's not okay just to say whatever's on your mind. Uh, the, the, don't be brutal with the truth. Uh, be kind. We'll get to that in just a moment. Um, and then not only truth, but the second thing there is apply Bible. If we apply Bible truth in our, our conversations, let me tell you, it would change everything. If you would, please take your Bible and turn back to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 6. Deuteronomy, chapter 6. And we'll look at a few verses here, starting at verse 4. Deuteronomy, chapter 6, and verses 4 through 9. <clears throat> Amen. I like to hear the pages turning to the Bible. Uh, I know uh, some like to use those electronic devices, but nothing beats the Bible. The problem with the, and I love those electronic devices, but the problem with that is you never learn where the books are. And so when you get the Bible in your hand, sometimes you'll have more difficulty finding it. But anyway, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. 
And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. <coughs> Listen to this. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. And shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house. And when thou walkest by the way. And when thou liest down. And when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and, thy, and, and they shall be a front, uh, as frontlets between thine eyes. And thou shalt write them upon the post of thy house and, up, and on thy gate, gates. By the way, you know one thing uh, most children do is they ask a lot of questions. Children like to ask questions. Why? Because they don't know. They want to learn. And so your children, mom and dad, are going to ask questions, and there's going to be opportunities to insert Bible truth. And I want to encourage you to do that. We are to speak the truth in love, and the best way to do that is with Bible truth. Even in your conversations, people ought to distinguish you between the rest of the world by the words that you use. You talk of the Lord. You may say amen. You, or you might, something good happens, praise the Lord. Or I'll be there tomorrow, Lord willing. Just little things like that's part of your conversation. That will stand out. That can be a tremendous witness and it helps you to speak the truth in love. Now, I want to take some time here to go into, with this thought in mind uh, of applying Bible to the family altar. I want to challenge you to have a family altar. And we, we need to be careful to uh, not only speak the truth in love in our relationships, but to bring the Bible into our relationships, into our home. And so it's absolutely vital uh, that, you know, that we're, we ought to uh, uh, have the kind of communication, if we're going to have be able to communicate like we should, like is pleasing to the Lord, that we have Bible, the Bible be, be taught and learned in our homes. In these verses in Deuteronomy, it's a great pattern in the Old Testament for the family altar. It's a good pattern for the family altar today. And so there, there should be times when we sit down with our families, as it says, in your houses, in your homes, and teach them the word of God. Rather than having um, posters of basketball players or football players, rather than having all these other <laughs> things on their wall, put some, you can, there's good posters with Bible verses on it. I mean, everywhere they look in your home, they see something about the Word of God. And it sparks conversations. It, 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 it brings a, a, a young people to questions. But that's the word of God. Then there should be a time, a set time, when you come together. <clears throat> I challenged the young people this past week to take 10 minutes. If that's all they can do, take 10 minutes to read their Bibles every day and to pray. Mm. 10 minutes, start there. I challenge you. Maybe some of you adults have, have a real hard time with that. You, you think I'm too busy. Take 10 minutes if you have... What you do, you take your alarm clock, you take it back 10 minutes, there you go. You've got an extra 10 minutes. Get up a little bit early and just read the Bible and pray and start your day off right. But then I think those of you who have children at home, start a family altar. Um, listen, we must talk about the Lord to our families and we must talk to the Lord about our families. If you want to talk to someone about what you heard or what you saw, go to the Lord and pray for them. Mom and dad, your ch children, think about this every day in just a couple weeks, children are going to be going back to school. Yes, I know, Cooper, you're excited about that. And, but their mom and dad, your, your children are heading out to school. They're heading into a culture that really is hostile to everything that we believe. It's hostile to the Bible. It's hostile to the church. It's hostile to the family. It's hostile to, to the Lord Jesus Christ. All the powers of hell 
are attacking, are against our family. And it's true. If you're not aware of that, I don't know where you've been, but you need to wake up. And so what I'm trying to say, how can we, with a clear mind, send our children out into the world and not take time to pray with them, pray for them, and to get the word of God, the truth of God into their hearts and minds? Go back to uh, Ephesians 4 if you're not there. Ephesians 4 and verse 29. The negative side of communication is there. Let no corrupt communications proceed out of your mouth. I say it again. There should never be foul language in the mouth of a Christian. It should not be there. I know everybody can make a mistake. It's hard to... Uh, uh, erase that uh, vocabulary that's been there maybe for years. But God is going to help you. Don't excuse yourself. Oh, well, I can't help it. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. That has no place in your life, Christian. Your children should never hear you use that kind of language. And young people, you should never use that language in school. You should never raise your voice to your parents, your grandparents, your teacher in school. Don't disrespect police officers. They're not there. Don't call them names. There should be no corrupt communication, no corrupt words that come out of your mouth. So um, then the positive side is this. But that, there in verse 29, that which is good to the to use of edify, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. That means that we're we not only apply truth, but we apply Bible in our conversations. So are you doing that? I mean, are the words that you're using, the conversations you're having, are they helpful? Are they edifying in building up other people? Are they trying to tear down? Well, I hear a lot of things, a lot of conversations, and some of them are so hurtful. You can't take those words back. Be careful what you say. And then another, a third thing is apply kindness. That goes a long way. Being kind. I know it seems like such a, uh, a simple thought, and it is simple, but today it's missing in a lot of areas. Kids aren't kind to one another at school. Uh, people aren't kind to one another at work. Kindness is gone. Sometimes even in church it's that way. And it ought not be. But that, it says, that which is good to the use of edifying. Yes, we must have a family altar where we, we bring the truth of God into our homes. We must pray for his power. We must pray for his presence to be upon uh, our young people. And, and let me just say, too, for those who may not have children, pray for the young people that you know that are here in our church, uh, that, uh, that they will... Uh, be protected by God and, and will live for God. Wouldn't it be great to see all of the young people that have come through this church over the years? Wouldn't it be great to see all of them living for God, being deacons in the church? You know what happens too often? I'll be in Pana somewhere, Tower Hill, it's happened in Shelbyville, and I'll hear somebody shout, hey, Pastor Randy, and I'll see the strangest looking guy come up to me. I have no idea who he is. I mean, he has a beard and all kinds of other things, and and I just and he says, "Oh, don't you recognize me?" No, uh, you used to bring me to church when I was well. You know, you change a lot after those that many years. But it's sad to see so many who are now they've left God, they've left the church, and they're out in the world, and they're doing what they think is fun. I've had many of them call me, Pastor Andy. I need help. You're the only one I can think of that might be able to help me. And I, I don't mind helping, but uh, I tell them, you know, what, they're really, what they really need is the Lord Jesus Christ in their life. Well, so, but apply kindness. Um, and we must learn how to communicate with one another if we're going to live in this world. There will be times when, you, you know, you need to deal with issues that arise in the family, that arise in any relationship. And we must learn to handle those issues properly. 
not by shouting at one another, not by screaming, not by cursing, but by prayer, by talking, communicating, and dealing with it. Then another uh, element that we need to add or apply to our conversation is, a lo is logic. Apply logic. When problems uh, must be addressed, here's a few things that we need to keep in mind. Number one, learn to attack the problem, not the people. Oh, I've heard too many times when a person gets flustered and they're angry, then they forget about the what they are fighting or mad about, and they attack the person. They call them names. They may curse at them. By the way, Christian, again, that should never happen with you. If that's a common, reoccurring thing in your life, you're not right with God. You need to get some things settled. There's a spiritual problem there. There's something lacking. But listen, we need to learn to attack the problem, not the per the people. Here in church, there's going to be times where we will differ. And there have been over the years. We may disagree on certain things going on, building, whatever it may be. But we need to learn that we never should attack one another. We can learn to disagree agreeably. We may not see eye to eye on every issue, but by the way, when it comes to this, that's where everything should be. That's how we can be of one accord, of one mind, because we follow the Word of God. The Word of God does bring unity to believers. But let's, let's understand that just logically speaking, learn to attack the problem, not the people. Um, do you know what donkeys do when they are threatened? It's a, it's a crazy thing, but they will actually uh, put their heads out uh, facing the enemy. So they'll have their rears all facing one another in a circle if there's that many donkeys. And then they'll start kicking. Not hurting the enemy at all. Not hurting the threat at all. They're kicking one another. And a lot of Christians do that. Oh, yeah. They see the problem coming. They know what, what the issue is, but they start kicking each other. They start attacking one another. Now, you're smarter than that. And so, and by the way, so are horses. Now, horses are different. They say horses will put their heads together and they will kick out anything that's coming at them. Now, that's the thing to do. They, uh, when the problem arises in our families and our churches, we should attack the enemy, not one another. And then secondly, learn to fix the problem and not to blame. Isn't that, look, we know kids do that. It wasn't me, it was my brother. She did it. Sisters are always good to blame. But we do that when we get older too. Uh, we, we play the blame game. Adam and Eve did it. Oh, Lord, it wasn't me, it was that woman you gave me. The woman that Eve said, it wasn't me, it's that serpent. We play that blame game. Well, let's uh, learn to fix the problem, not to blame. Don't always be looking for someone to blame for the problem. You know, uh, young people, a lot of times the problem you have with your teacher or with other kids at school, it's not really them. It may lie, the problem is right in here. And we need to face that. Uh, we don't, instead of looking for someone else to blame, maybe I should be looking right here in my own heart, my own mind, and see where the problem lies. And so every member of your family is to be a valued member. Every member of the family is to be listened to, just like every member of the church. Some people think, well, uh, you know, they, they have the idea that, well, it's just a pastor. He's a dictator. He's a ruler. That is not the Bible way at all. Listen, I... I, uh, I am responsible. I am a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ, but I, God has called me to be a pastor to serve you. You are the church. It's not just me. This is not my ministry alone. This is God's ministry, and he's put us here to work together. And so learn, let, let us learn to not blame, not look for someone to uh, uh, put, pass the buck on, but just to... Uh, uh, Realize that everyone's a valued member of God's family and to work together. And you know what? Sometimes there's different things that we can do. Uh, sometimes different roles that we can fill. When there's a, uh, a, a disagreement or a problem, 
Sometimes you're just a, you're a bucket holder. What I mean by that is you just hold the bucket while the person is just share, opening their heart to you. You say, well, I don't have any answers. I don't have anything. I don't, I don't know what to do. Just listen. That's what I'm talking about. Learn to be a good listener. Now, a lot of times, us men especially, we want to be a fixer. We think, oh, I've got, a, I've got an answer for every problem. I've got the solution. I can fix this. No, we can't. Not everything. No, we can't. Sometimes the best thing we can do is to close our mouths and listen. And that would go a long way in, a, in, in building a conversation or building a communication in your relationship. And, and then we need to learn, uh, uh, in James 1.19, it says, that's a great verse. It would do us all uh, well to not only just read it, but to heed it. If you would, turn back to the book of James. I want to show you this verse, chapter 1, verse 19. James chapter 1, and verse 19. The Word of God says here in James 1, 19, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to what? To hear. Swift to hear. Yeah. Too often, we're kind of like Peter. We're swift to speak. Well, I'm going to give him a piece or her a piece of my mind. And I, oh, I know the answer. Lord, I'll never forsake you. I'll never leave you. These other guys might, but not me, Peter said. And how often have we been so quick to speak and try to fix a problem? But it says, be swift to hear. And then it goes on, slow to speak. Oh, that's hard for some of us. We can't handle silence. We don't want it to be quiet. But uh, this is what the Bible tells us. Swift to hear, slow to speak. And then slow to what? Wrath. Right. Boy, um, some people have a hard time with that. Maybe it is anger that is your weak point. Maybe you are like that ticking time bomb. And if somebody says something wrong, somebody looks at you in the wrong way that you think is the wrong way, you blow up. You need to ask God for help in that area. God knows your weakness. And most likely, if that is your weakness, everybody around you knows that's your weakness. So it, it, admit it. Call it what it is. Lord, I'm, I'm, I've sinned against you. I, I, I've been a bad uh, representative of yours. I, I've been a bad Christian. God, help me to control my anger. And then we, uh, we must learn, really, uh, again, it can't be stressed enough to listen Look at the individual and just listen to what they're saying. Don't be thinking in your mind, okay, what am I going to come back with? What, what is my uh, response to this? Just listen. Um, and, you know, a lot of times we pride ourselves in thinking, hey, I can do, I can multitask. I can do uh, several things at the same time. For instance, I can take the TV remote and I can change channels, eat popcorn, and also look at a magazine at the same time. Now, I'm, I'm kind of exaggerating maybe a bit there, but you may pride yourself in multitasking. But when it comes to communication, let's put all those things away because you need to focus, you need to listen, you need to look at them and learn to, uh, uh, to share in their conversation. Rejoice with them when something good happens. Weep with them when something bad has happened. Uh, there are times that, Another thing that you might hold, be a mirror, hold up a mirror. And what I mean by that, by putting up a mirror, you, you help them see the, the problem by asking questions, by kind responses. You're not lecturing them. You're just trying to help them see what really is going on. Because you, you understand, you've been there, I'm sure many of you have, where you're involved in a situation and you can only see one thing. And it's just... Uh, you may be overwhelmed, you may be angry and hurting or whatnot, but uh, maybe God will use you to be to that other person to be like a mirror. So uh, you, you fix the problem by listening to the whole situation, not playing the blame game. Then learn to uh, keep it private, not public. You, you know, that, that should, that's a, that's a real problem. When someone comes to you, Confidentially, they're going to talk to you. 
They want to share, open their heart. You need to keep it quiet. If you can't keep it quiet, tell them. You know, let's, I'll pray for you, but I don't really need to know anything. Uh, because, listen, there's nothing worse than uh, you coming to a pastor. You're coming, we're talking back here, you're opening your heart. And then to me, for me to get up behind this pulpit, and I may not use the name, but I use all the things that are going on. And everybody in the church says, oh, I know who that is. That's wrong. Pastors have done that. I've heard they've done that. That's sinful. It's wrong. We should be, what a person tells me in confidence should stay uh, in just between us and the Lord. And now, if a guy comes to me and says, uh, I, I'd like to clarify it, you know, before, is this is in confidence, Pastor. Well, have you broken the law? <laughs> have you done something illegal? Because I'm not going to keep that confidence. If you beat your wife, I'm calling the cops. If you have uh, stole or robbed from the bank, I'm calling the cops. But I'll work with you. I'll even go to the jail and visit you, but I'm not going to cover for you. I'm not going to hide. I, I remember one time some teenagers came. You know, they got their license. They've been coming for a long time. I've been bringing them to church. And these girls, they got their, one got their license. So they showed up for church, except the one with their license. And then all of a sudden, right when church was getting ready to start, I noticed they all were gone. They had gotten in the car with a girl that came in by herself, and they all took off for Shelbyville. So what I did, I went and called every one of their dads. I said, so-and-so, hey, I'm not going to cover for anybody, and they're my responsibility when I bring them. I called the dads. I said, this is what's happened. I think they went to Shelbyville. I would have loved to have been there when their dad showed up in that parking lot where they were all hanging out. And uh, they had told them, we're in church, Dad. And there they were. But, you know, I, I, what I'm saying is I'm not going to cover for anyone doing wrong. But I, if it's incompetence, it stays incompetence. Learn to keep it private, not public. Don't air that dirty laundry for everyone. And then learn that when you bring it out, pray it up. When you bring it out, pray it up. Bring God into the situation. Now, let me quickly move on here. I'm going to wrap things up. Apply some biblical promises. Um, this is what's wonderful about this passage. Every member of the Trinity is involved in this. Uh, we have the presence of the Holy Spirit. God's Holy Spirit is that unseen guest in your family, in your relationships. He is grieved when we refuse to live like the, the new creatures that we are in Christ Jesus. And then in verse 32, the Bible speaks of God the Father. Even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. We have the power of God himself, God the Father. If, you're, if your family is a Christian family, God is there. The power of God is going to help you to forgive. You know, sometimes it's harder to forgive a family member than it is to forgive a neighbor we don't really know that well. Sometimes that is. Uh, you probably know some individuals that they haven't spoke to each other in years, brothers or blood sisters. That ought not be. And it definitely ought not be in the church among believers. And then in, in, in Ephesians 5, 2, we, we read about God the Son. He, walk in love as Christ has loved us and given himself for us. Uh, we have the peace of Christ in our families when we learn to communicate like him, like Jesus. The language of love. Oh, I, um, I'm going to wrap this up with just telling you a little story here. There was a woman who, she went to a counselor. And she, uh, she was very upset at her husband. And she said, you know, I am so mad. I'm tired of that man. I, I'm, I'm going to divorce that man. I'm, I'm not only gonna, going to divorce him. I don't want to just divorce him. I want to destroy him. I want to destroy him. And so she uh, says, I'm here for you to help me, to tell me how to do just that. Well, the counselor, he said, I'll tell you what you do. If you uh, want not only to divorce your husband, you, you want to destroy him, here's what you do. You go home, act as if everything is fine. And then you praise him and you honor him uh, and you are responsive to him. <coughs> You cook him his favorite meals. You tell him how wonderful he is. You tell him that he is, he is your hero. Tell him that he is your everything. You do this for several days. And then you finally, when you get, um, 
him in that situation, you hit him with both barrels. I mean, after you done treated him so nice, then you hit him with both barrels, and you tell him that you're going to divorce him and absolutely take everything that he has. You're not going to leave him with a thin dime, and that will destroy him. So several months go by, the counselor hadn't heard from the woman. So he thought, well, I'm going to call her and see how things are going. So he does. He calls her, and, and uh, he said, are, are you about ready for that divorce? And she says, what divorce? Uh, she said, I am married to the most wonderful man in all the world. Why in the world do I want to divorce him? And so it does go a long way how we, you know, so many times, here's what we want to do. Well, he did that, so I'm going to retaliate and get back. God doesn't hope, take you or excuse you because of what other people did. If you're a husband, God holds you to your duties regardless of what your wife did. If you're a wife, God holds you to your duties as a wife regardless of what your husband did. Now, you might be surprised what a little praise and a little respect, a little love might do in your family or in any relationship. So one of the best things that we can ever do for our families is learn to communicate. Communicate. And I know we've got a lot of things working against that. There's power in communication. And the devil knows that too. And so there's so many things in our world today that distract, <laughs> that take away from communication. If, if you are communicating through text, you're not a good communicator. I'm saying is that if that's the only way you do it. I'm, okay, I'm not anti-text, uh, although I do not use my thumbs. I speak. <laughs> and uh, I, uh, I'm not, uh, I'm just saying you need to learn Ask God to help you to be able to communicate with your parents, communicate with your spouse, communicate with your teachers at school, with, with uh, uh, adults, young people, and learn how to communicate with one another in the church, our extended family. But look, look uh, uh, you know, here at the Word of God, it gives us the uh, clear instructions of how we are to communicate. Let's allow God to have his way. And as I closed last week, I closed today. How you communicate with others could be a reflection of how you're communicating with God. Maybe there is no communication with God. Maybe you don't read your Bible. You don't pray. Maybe you've grown cold towards the things of God. And so I, I urge you to get back with God. Communicate with Him. Pray. Read your Bibles every day.